Okay, they sort of closed off one uh, <laughs> plot hole, but opened up kind of a bigger one. Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name's Ed Hope, a junior doctor in the UK, and you may notice I'm in familiar settings. I'm back in the studio, and that's because things are quieting down a little bit more at work, meaning I get an opportunity to pop over here and film some stuff for you. And what better way in the midst of a pandemic than to review a film about a virus outbreak, this one called Outbreak 1995 Classic. And I thought we'd talk a little bit about the scenes, break them down. I'm sure many of them will be familiar to you guys as well, given you know, our lives have changed so much given this pandemic. But I thought I'd talk to you about some of my experiences during this pandemic as well through the eyes of this film. So let's crack on with it. 30 men dead yesterday. 18 the day before. We need supplies. Plasma, penicillin. I'll get you everything you need, doctor. So the film opens up in the 1960s here, presumably an outbreak of what we're gonna see later on in the movie. And the doctor asks for supplies of plasma and penicillin, which makes sense in this context, given the area of the world and we're seeing these bleeding type symptoms. Because I'm guessing we're in some kind of tropical environment here that they're dealing with a type of hemorrhagic fever, so a bleeding fever. Plasma is the fluid part of the blood, so once you've taken out all the cells, it's everything that's left, so it contains salts and proteins that are vital for life. One of these proteins are the clotting factors, and why replacing plasma can be part of its treatment. Penicillin was also mentioned, certainly helps in infection, but only a bacterial infection, it's an antibiotic. So when you're fighting a severe infection, even a viral infection, this can lower your immune defenses, so leaves you somewhat open to get a secondary bacterial infection. What the hell? In the previous scene, they said, I'll authorize an airdrop immediately. I didn't think that's what they had in mind. It's a pretty extreme way of dealing with a virus and there's no reason why a strict quarantine couldn't have the same effect in stopping the outbreak spreading and also giving the people within that area a chance of dealing with the infection with some outside help. And now we're back in the present day at the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. I just had to Google that to make sure I got it right. And Jesus, I hope their research facilities are more up to date than their website. And we're given this really nice introductory tour to the biosafety levels, which all seem to kind of check out. gives a good flavor of the type of things that are going on and the idea of this biosafety level. The biosafety level three we see here is pretty close to what we use when we see patients with COVID-19 and we're doing aerosol generating procedures. So we've got gowns, goggles, gloves, a respirator mask. But this bit here where the lady walks out and just takes off her mask, that's terrible doffing. It's a dangerous point in the procedure when you're taking off your PPE because the virus could be all over your gear and you're kind of throwing it up in the air and then breathing it in. So just whipping the mask off like this, not a good way of doing it. It kind of reminds me of <laughs> the intro of The Simpsons where Homer just is working and then just, right, time to go. Ah! All these diseases listed here, pretty darn accurate. Um, and I love that in each part of the lab, the music increases in tempo. I wonder if that's what really it's like, you know, people in <laughs> biosafety level one just chilling out people in biosafety level three like on edge every five seconds. And finally here we see a positive pressure suit in the biosafety level four area. So these coiled tubes that come from the ceiling would be supplying airflow into the suit so to make sure there's always pressure inside the suit. And um, so things will naturally flow away even if the suit becomes damaged. This is 
to prevent any exposure. We use this idea of airway pressure in a variety of hospital environments. So in operating theatres, they tend to have positive pressure to stop any germs from drifting in from the corridors. Whereas if someone has a highly infectious condition, ideally we want to isolate them in a negative pressure room to stop any of the air in there from escaping out into the corridors and infecting other people. You may have heard of this biosafety level four lately in the context of COVID-19 as the initial outbreak happened in Wuhan, China, which just so happens to be the home of one of China's biosafety level four sites, which has led to many people thinking this may have been the accidental source of the outbreak, although there is no proof of that. There's vomiting, diarrhea, bleeding in the nose, ears, gums, the eyes hemorrhage, the internal organs shut down. They liquid. That's very good, Major. Uh, we've read that in the book too, but... I don't think a textbook would quite put it like that. But that is a fairly accurate description of a hemorrhagic fever infection, you know, kind of like the one we saw in the opening scene. So hemorrhagic fever is an umbrella term for a disease caused by a handful of viruses, usually in tropical parts of the world, most infamously Ebola, because of the outbreak in 2013 that killed over 10,000 people, mainly in West Africa. The fever is very common, so something like 90% of people with Ebola would have it. The overt hemorrhage part so the actual bleeding from places like your back passage your gums or under your skin is much less common around about 20% of cases but you'd still see changes within the blood related to bleeding even if you didn't actually have this visible hemorrhage <laughs> What? I was just about to say that this is massively unrealistic because it would go against every instinct to take your mask off, but I could kind of relate to this idea of claustrophobia and feeling like you're gonna pass out because it's kind of happened to me once. Working with this level of PPE, so with a, a suit with a hood is horrendous. I mean, I've only done it once before and that was in training when I was doing uh, major incident training and they're extremely hot terrible visibility and really difficult to you know do fine movements too and the time that i always passed out or kind of did pass out i didn't have anywhere near this kind of level of ppe i was a surgical junior so assisting in a pretty long and intense operation where i was fully scrubbed in so gown mask and gloves and I accidentally came around very hot and thought I was about to pass out. It's the only time it happened. I managed to put the instruments down, call out to someone, and then <laughs> was rescued by the theater nurses who kind of stripped me out of the PPE and uh, kind of brought me around a little bit. Luckily, the patient was fine, everything was fine, but it just goes to show I, I'd been involved in loads of operations and that one just so happened to be the one that <laughs> knocked me off the perch a bit. So as much as this is pretty dramatic, in this kind of hot tropical environment with this kind of gear on, seeing these kind of things for the first time, I don't think this is, you know, crazy unrealistic. Do you know the incubation period? No, but it kills in two or three days. The mortality rate is 100%. Jesus. So they're unsure of the incubation period, so that's how long from exposure to having symptoms, but we know it kills in two to three days. That is crazy fast. And the mortality of 100%, which is, you know, the worst you can get. So let's relate this back to Ebola because that's, I think, what the writers would have been referencing, even though this film came out 20 years before the largest Ebola outbreak in 2013. So Ebola has an incubation period of around 10 days and then usually fatal around seven days later. And Ebola is considered pretty fast, one of the reasons why it doesn't spread rapidly because it makes you too sick too quickly and it has a mortality of around 25 to 90%, but on average around about 50%. So it's fair to say in this film, we're dealing with a real super strength hemorrhagic fever virus when compared to Ebola, which even in, on its own is a pretty lethal virus. Every American kid's lunchbox. Do you remember that? Yeah, I was wrong. You were wrong. Uh -huh. What about 1992, lots of fever? I was wrong, wrong again. Yep. 
But you lied about this. No, I could be wrong about Yet this. You walked into don't... my party smelling like dirty socks. I could be wrong about this. That is brilliant. That is exactly how a scientist talks. We know we could be wrong. And I think it's very often why we lose arguments to people that don't use science because they're so sure because they have a belief. The attitude of pointing out that epidemiologists were wrong before and therefore, you know, ridiculing their future predictions is a dangerous game. And it really just goes to show how difficult tracking and projecting outbreaks are. Forget Ebola, forget Lhasa. This bug kills so fast, Billy, you can wipe down. In. That is exactly my point, sir. What? It is the very lethality of this virus which is working for us here. These unfortunate people don't live long enough to spread the goddamn thing around. So you're right, it is contained. I hope so. Right, so we have a reference to Ebola and Lhasa fever here, both types of hemorrhagic fevers as we thought were likely to be the writer's inspiration for this screenplay. An interesting point that the general says here is that this new virus kills even quicker than these, which is bad if you actually have it, but good to limit its spread as a large outbreak is only gonna happen if you're able to spread the virus to lots of people before you get really sick. These pictures were taken over a period of eight hours, normal healthy kidney cells before they meet the virus. In the space of an hour, a single virus has invaded so I'm no histopathologist, but you know, these could easily be kidney cells. The dark dots in the middle would be the cell nucleus. We have the cell membrane around the outside and we can see all the organelles in the cytoplasm as well and are surrounded by this connective tissue matrix as well. So I've had a look at this shot for a few minutes now and I'm not quite sure if this is a kidney or some other tissue, but assuming this is the kidney, and because of the kind of irregular shape of these cells, I think these would be mesangial cells. So they're a kind of helper cell. They help regulate the blood flow through this filter system of the kidney, and it's also to preserve this connective tissue matrix that we see here. But the more I look at this, the less convinced I am what we're looking at, uh, because you'd expect to see some of the small blood vessels, so some of the capillaries as well, which we can't see here, but hey, I'm giving it a go. In the space of an hour, a single virus has invaded, multiplied and killed the cell. And in just over two hours, its offspring have invaded nearby cells here and here, continually multiplying. Jesus Christ, five hours? That's a really nice sequence in demonstrating how a virus is an obligate parasite. So it's unable to grow and reproduce on its own. It needs to invade the cells hijack their cellular machinery to create more viruses and in doing so causes the cell to burst and be destroyed as the virus is then released. One goes in, millions come out. Every cell is dead. Now we see them individually, searching for the next victim until there's nothing left to kill. Okay, so here we go. These are unmistakably, unmistakably. <laughs> These are filoviruses of which Ebola is a type of filovirus. So filo means thread in Latin because as you can see here, they kind of have this thread-like shape to them. And exactly as I said, Ebola tends to take days, whereas this virus is taking hours. That's pretty scary stuff. I hate this bug. Come on, Casey. You have to love its simplicity. It's one billionth our size and it's beating us. So what do you want to do, take it to dinner? That's a really interesting sentiment that I heard a few times from medical colleagues during COVID-19. Definitely a hatred for its brutal mortality and its impact on people's lives, but also a respect and a marvel at its makeup. It appeared to be doing things differently, particularly with regards to clotting and this triggering of the immune system. You know, things that we just hadn't seen before. Well, I suppose I understand your allegiance to your ex-husband, but both you and I know that the chances of this virus showing up in the US are virtually nil. <laughs> uh, do you remember when we had that kind of sentiment with COVID-19? I saw people saying that. Hmm? You know, music is supposed to soothe the savage beast. What? Wow. Okay, so, I mean, we found out who patient zero is in the US. It's only blooming Dr. McDreamy face. How the hell did he get into medical school after causing an outbreak of viral hemorrhagic fever? Help! Morning, Rudy. Lucretia. 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 Lucretia.
she won't touch those shredded beef wafers, so we'll have to go back to the veal. What's wrong? Can you hear me? Come on, Rudy, help me out here. Squeeze my hand. Looks like toxic shot. It was fine yesterday. Come on, Rudy. Looks like toxic shot. <laughs> It's a pretty ballsy diagnosis. You wouldn't necessarily make that diagnosis straight away because it's pretty rare, but I can see why he said it. And that's because toxic shock is where you have a severe immune reaction to the toxins produced from a bacterial infection. And it causes a distinctive rash, what we call erythroderma. And as you may recall earlier, hemorrhagic fevers can also cause a rash. And in this clinical setting, so within this hospital in the US, US, you wouldn't be expecting a viral hemorrhagic fever. So a diagnosis of toxic shock given this rash isn't a bad shout. But realistically, in this scenario, you'd have a working diagnosis of septic shock, which is much more common than toxic shock, but they're both treated the same with oxygen, fluids, and antibiotics, you know, which we can see all happening there. Think about these really bad strip cases in news. Maybe I should subscribe. Henry, get me a blood culture, chemistry profile, and a blood count. And interesting as well, the other doctor here in this scenario mentions strep cases that are going on in, in the newspapers. So Streptococcus pyogenes is one of the bacteria that its toxin can lead to toxic shock. Get me a blood culture, chemistry profile, and a blood count. And so they're doing a blood culture. Again, a mainstay of management in infection. This is where we take some blood from a patient and put it in some nutritious solution and store it away in the lab to see if we can grow a particular bacterium to figure out what's causing the infection and thus tailor the antibiotic accordingly. This generally takes a few days to get a result. So initially we have to treat you know, on the most likely cause. They also mentioned blood chemistry. So this would be looking at things like the kidney and liver function, both of which you'd expect to be deranged as the virus may be attacking these directly as we saw from that electron mic microscope diagram earlier. But in shock, these organs can also show signs of injury because they're not getting enough blood flow to them, particularly the kidney. And so this really helps us to determine the severity of what's going on. A full blood count would help us diagnose what's going on. So a change in the condition or number of red blood cells could indicate occult bleeding somewhere from the hemorrhagic fever. Platelets may also decrease as they can be used up doing their job of plugging gaps again from the bleeding and immune cells may increase or decrease in numbers depending on what type of infection the body is fighting. So for example, neutrophils would increase in a bacterial infection. And in COVID-19, we tend to see a decrease in lymphocytes in the blood. So we may see this type of thing. Uh, these are the immune cells that help fight viral infections and they decrease in the blood as they move out of the blood into the tissues to fight the virus. So actually the medical team here would have a good idea of what's going on from the initial blood results, that it's probably more likely to be a viral infection rather than a bacterial one, and that there's probably something funky going on with the bleeding. These blood tests in the emergency department, we typically get back within around about an hour. We have this nice sequence here in the cinema, which really should remind everyone the importance of wearing face masks in a pandemic. And so far in this film, we've seen mainly transmission through blood and the fecal oral routes, but not through droplets or you know, airborne that we're starting to see here. So I'm assuming the virus has had some kind of mutation. Not so realistic. I mean, mutations happening, yes, given the fact the virus replicates millions of times in each person, there are gonna be mistakes and therefore mutations, but a major step mutation to suddenly mean it's very effective at <laughs> being transmitted through the air or via droplets, that's massively rare. That We'll let him off that one. It's airborne. Well, as we thought, but pretty tough scene to watch uh, this given the fact that it's exposed pretty much everyone at the hospital 
what we'd call um, a nosocomial spread. This is the term we use for a hospital acquired infection. And, you know, it goes against the first principle of medicine to do no harm. But, you know, where do you go when you're really sick? You need the hospital, but where are lots of other sick people going to be? The hospital as well. And I know we've had huge adaptions in the UK to try and, you know, deal with this. Um, and in the most part, it's meant closing services that aren't related to COVID-19, having a huge impact on that. But you can understand why, because these people coming in for other treatments, you do not want to expose people, particularly people who are sick already, to something like this virus, something that they haven't figured out yet. And you know, touched on in quite a, a brutal way here, but it's a very real problem. Listen, Alvarez died of the original strain. Seward died of the new strain. Now, these are too close together on the tree for the virus to have suddenly spontaneously mutated. So I think that the host animal is carrying both strains. Okay, that's a nice little cover. You know, we talked about earlier how the way the virus was transmitted, going to suddenly being airborne and droplet, they basically explained it here that the, the monkey, so the host actually had two strains in it, so it didn't actually mutate. So they've kind of, Covered that one off nicely. Wait a minute, wait, wait. Alvarez worked at a pet store. Pet store? Yeah. I'm just learning this now? We just got it, Sam. Jesus, if the host is there and Casey's right, then it's carrying antibodies to both strains. I'm at the pet store. So. Okay, they sort of closed off one uh, <laughs> plot hole, but opened up kind of a bigger one. Okay, it's probably really important to find the host animal in terms of research, but so what if, the, if this monkey has got antibodies? You can't just take the antibodies out and give them to a human. Is, is that where we're heading? We've seen a few scenes like this, so showing civil unrest and you'd like to think this was a dramatization, but you know, we saw that in our pandemic. You know, if they ever want to do a film like this again, they need B-roll, it's fine. This pandemic has given us loads of stock footage of people fighting over loo rolls. Listen very carefully. Put General Ford on the phone, tell him it's Colonel Daniels and it's urgent. Sam, where the hell are you? Billy! We're on our way back. We got the host. What? We found the host, Billy. <sighs> <laughs> They're gonna be so disappointed when they figure out just because they've got a monkey with antibodies, that will not help anybody in the town. I mean, so far the film has been pretty good, but this ridiculous sequence of them trying to locate the monkey, and I mean, it has been ridiculous. <laughs> You less flying around the US on a helicopter chasing this monkey so they can get antibodies from it with you know what are they going to do rub the monkey up against the people or give the monkey blood to the people it's not going to work I mean I'm itching to find out what they do with this monkey she's still out how you doing Betsy Salt. Sir. Use the E-1101 as a roadmap to synthesize an anti-serum. I'll get right on it. We got an awful lot of people here. Hey, I'll copy it big time. I mean, I want leaders of it. Yes, sir. I want everything in place. So they want liters of an anti-serum that they're just gonna synthesize from a monkey. Easy, so easy. It's so obvious. Find the animal that caused it, put it through a anti-serum printer and make some liters of it. Why don't we just do that? It goes without saying, you can't go from capturing a monkey to liters and liters of antibody type serum against a virus. And, and people go from like 100% mortality to 100% cure. That is just pure Hollywood. <laughs> 
So what is true? Well, you probably know that antibodies are proteins produced by your immune system to help fight infections, and some of these can stick around and help protect you against future infections from the same bug. And in some illnesses, taking antibodies from someone who has recovered from an infection and giving it to someone with a current infection can actually help that person fight the infection. That's been shown to work in things like rabies. We can also, to some extent, manufacture antibodies antibodies. So Ebola has a very much experimental antibody treatment called ZMAP, where we create an immune cell in a lab to produce specific antibodies that work against Ebola. This wouldn't have been around in the 90s and even now is extremely expensive and as I said experimental and cannot be manufactured quickly in large numbers like we see in the movie. And probably in the most bizarre but sort of relevant area here, I read about a potential COVID-19 treatment that involves harvesting the antibodies from llamas. Super experimental, and I'm pretty sure llamas weren't the source of COVID-19. Um, so whichever way you look at this here in this movie, this is a pretty, uh, <laughs> how, how can we say it? Let's just say they're taking a large creative license with the science. So there you have it, my look at Outbreak. That was kind of fun to get back into looking at these shows and breaking down some of the seas. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And thank you so, so much for all your support on the channel, particularly um, because I haven't been doing these type of videos, which many of you subscribed for originally. I'm gonna get back onto these things now. I've got more of a normal work-life balance. So if there's any films or TV shows or anything you want me to break down, then leave a comment below. And as always, take care of yourselves and I'll see you soon. Yeah.